cut in half by the uh, archaeologist who had sent it, uh, and uh, one had been sent to the States, and, and that was lost forever. Um, but this, uh, from this half, tiny half finger bone, he extracted enough DNA uh, for resequencing. And uh, when that sequence was uh, analyzed and mapped, it turned out it wasn't humans, it wasn't Neanderthals, it was a third human lineage, uh, which became known as the Denisovan lineage. And, and that uh, sparked a lot of uh, interest uh, and, and was covered very uh, heavily in the popular press. Um, so it's a real uh, pleasure and honor to have uh, Johannes with us today. Um, and uh, today, uh, Johannes is going to talk about uh, the evolutionary history of human pathogens. So with, with that short introduction, uh, I'll hand the screen back over to you, Johannes, and, and thank you very much uh, again for joining us today. Thanks, Brandon, for the, for the great introduction. And uh, also, um, yeah, thanks for everyone listening in. It's a shame I'm not there in person. We can actually meet in person, but that will hopefully change sometime in the future. I'm still glad to have the possibility to talk about some of our research. Um, and uh, the focus today is mostly plague um, and the kind of genetic history of plague that we have uncovered from ancient pandemics over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, but I will also touch on some of the other pathogens. Um, I will kind of walk you back in time um, from kind of recent uh, pandemics to some prehistoric um, um, larger epidemics of plague. Um, and I will also cover our latest story, which is actually in print, is not uh, published yet, um, on the origin of the Black Death. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll hope I can stir some of your, your interest on that topic. So when we talk about ancient human pathogens, uh, we have to be aware that there are kind of three major, what we call epidemiological transitions, where really something changed in the way how humans interacted with, with pathogens. And, and the first one people usually refer to is the Neolithization. So the time when people settled down, developed agriculture and especially domesticated animals. It's thought today that most of the pathogens that we have in the human population originated through zoonotic origin, and I guess we're all familiar with that now. I mean, Saudi Arabia, you had MERS some years ago, but the world has SARS now, SARS-CoV-2, um, COVID, um, causing pathogen that um, emerged probably from, from, from bats. Um, and uh, I guess MERS was from, from camels. Um, but there's many other pathogens that we're pretty sure of um, emerged from, from animals, and many of them probably early on when we started to domesticate and interact very closely with those with those animals. And there's a few examples here, measles, smallpox, flu, tuberculosis, plague, leprosy, pertussis are all examples where people have suggested that they came from our domestic animals into the human population. And of course, part of the transition is also the kind of sedentary lifestyle. Before that time period, around eight, nine, 10,000 years ago, we were living in uh, as nomadic hunter-gatherers, uh, kind of mobile groups of people, small bands, maybe like 15, 20 people, um, but then everything changed. We settled down, villages, small little cities, we would call it now, developed with thousands of people living together, very close living quarters, like here, you can see Chateau Huyuk about 9,000 years ago. Um, and you can imagine that such a settlement is a much more interesting habitat for a pathogen than a small group of mobile people, uh, because even if they catch something from an animal that they might kill, um, it might infect the whole population, but that's than 15 people. Whereas if it's say this family down here gets a pathogen from those goats, there's a very high chance that the pathogen spreads in the whole population. And then even through weeks, maybe on kind of uh, some uh, trading routes, it goes into the next village and infects people there. So really only with that transition, um, humans became an interesting uh, host for most pathogens because before that the population was too small and not connected enough. But then we became a herd animal living in large groups like we are today. And then, you know, most pathogens then found us attractive, whereas before that, we were actually not attractive at all to most um, pathogens. And some of those pathogens then caused large outbreaks that we then also pick up from historical records. I list a few here that we know from some kind of early history, the plague of Athens in the fifth century before Christ, killing the leader of Athens at the time, Pericles. Athens was defeated by Sparta, not the time they lost to Sparta but uh, it certainly had a large impact on, on that conflict um, in the Peloponnese. And the Antonine Plague, also quite famous because it ended the expansion of the Roman Empire. Millions of people died in the Roman Empire's 
not really clear what it was. Some people think it was smallpox, but no pathogen has been isolated yet from that time period. Uh, Justinianic plague is also quite famous. Um, I will talk more about that as the first plague pandemic. We know it was caused by plague uh, based on uh, molecular biology um, evidence now, ancient DNA. Um, but it also had a tremendous effect on human history. It's the end of antiquity, it's the beginning of the dark age, the medieval time. Um, millions of people, up to 50 million, died in the Mediterranean at that time. And we now know it even spread through Northern Europe. So it was found in Great Britain, for example, in one study we published two years ago. And then, of course, the infamous Black Death that probably all of you have heard about, the medieval plague um, in the 14th century, um, that killed half of all Europeans and probably was spread all over Eurasia at the time. Um, but then, fortunately, one can say in the 19th century and in the early 20th century, um, new medical treatments became available. I mean, first it was hygiene, which was probably the biggest kind of changer in terms of life expectancy in humans. So some people estimate that we gained more than 20 years because of hygiene, just because of that type of treatment that we know that sterilized things really made a big difference. But then, of course, this antibiotics vaccination programs introduced in the 20th century that really made a change and kind of changed life expectancy and also led to a point where a lot of medical doctors in the 20th century, especially in the mid 20th century, thought that by the end of the 20th century, infectious diseases will be eradicated within humans because we have vaccines, we have antibiotics, so they're not a problem anymore. And that actually led to something that is almost now seen in the retro perspective as, as one of the biggest mistakes of the 20th century, because the focus changed from researching infectious diseases to more kind of lifestyle diseases, like obesity, for example, or diabetes, which of course are also important, but the, the focus was much, much less on infectious diseases over the last 20 years. And in a way, the last two years have shown how still important infectious diseases are and how, of course, still infectious diseases can cause a lot of damage and be a major problem to the human population. And that is then therefore now also called the so-called third epidemiological transition. Since the 1980s, we see actually new infectious diseases spreading. So instead of defeating them, we actually have many more than we used to have. Um, and there's lots of examples, I mean, SARS being one, but also, of course, HIV, um, Hansa, Ebola, Lyme disease, they, they are newly emerging. We, the human population moves into places where they had been before, they pick them up or kind of have access to or contact with animals um, that they didn't have before. And then the other problem is re-emerging infectious diseases, something like tuberculosis. People thought it's almost defeated, and now it's coming back because it's becoming antibiotic resistance. And antibiotic resistance is a huge problem. It's like spreading all over the world. Within one year, almost every kind of antibiotic kind of produces antibiotic resistance strains. Um, artificially, in the petri dish, you can produce it within 24 hours if the bacteria become resistant to that antibiotic. Um, and that will become a really big problem in the 21st century because no new antibiotics get developed, but a lot of strains become antibiotic resistant. So therefore, infectious diseases are still a very important topic. However, as we have also seen the last two years in the corona pandemic, we know surprisingly little about the origin, about the evolution, about how fast do they change through time, what's the mutation rate, the interaction between host and, 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 and uh, pathogen. So how do they adapt to humans? How does an animal pathogen become a human pathogen? What happens within the human genome? Do, do, do they also adapt to those pathogens over time? And that's really something that I've found working with you know, Neanderthals then 10 years ago, kind of became interested also in pathogens um, and then saw that we don't know so many things about pathogens. And the main reason why we don't know so much about them is that we don't have fossils from the past. Um, we don't have pathogens fossils. We don't know how they looked like 10,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago or 500 years ago. Because unlike with humans, where we have Neanderthals or Homo erectus or, or Australopithecus or something, or with a mammoth, we have you know, a, a fossil kind of elephant, we don't really have that for, for, for pathogens. And that's where we started with this new field of research that we call ancient pathogen genomics, where what we then basically do is we, we take ancient samples, usually we take teeth from skulls, because a tooth is kind of like a capsula that preserves the dried blood. Uh, so a blood-borne pathogen might still be present um, in this ancient um, uh, skull, for example. We extract the DNA, we drill little holes, release the DNA, um, and then by high throughput sequencing, reconstruct genomes from pathogens from the past. And that produces some sort of molecular fossils. 
right? So we don't have, of course, that's still the shape of that, but we have the, the, the blueprint, we have the genome of that ancient pathogen. We can see how it changed through time. We can see how tuberculosis looked like a thousand years ago, 5,000 years ago, how plague looked like hundreds or thousands of years ago, and how it changed through time, how it adapted and, and how it evolved. So we learned something about the interaction between the pathogen and, and the host. So for example, for plague, you will see we have found the genes that changed that then uh, caused, for example, the adaptation to the flea. So that the early form of plague was not flea adapted, but then through time it became adapted and flea became the vector and to transmit the disease. But we can also identify causative agents of past pandemics. So we now know what caused the gestinianic plague. We now know what caused the Black Death. We do know also for a lot of other epidemic events like 16th century Mesoamerica, what diseases were brought in by the Spaniards that killed Native Americans. So this is really exciting and really allows us basically some sort of like look into the past and, and get information about the diseases that were spreading into past populations. And it's largely research that I did with those three researchers, so Kirsty, Alexander, and Verena, who were uh, PhD students or postdocs with me, and Kirsty and Alexander are now group leaders here at the department in Leipzig, and Verena is a professor now in Vienna. We did a lot of work together on Yersinia pestis, and that's what I will mostly focus today about. But I just want to mention we also worked a lot on leprosy, so from um, many different sites over the last couple of thousand years, including, in fact, Egyptian mummies. So they also um, had leprosy at that time in ancient Egypt, um, and we could even reconstruct genomes from those ancient mummies. We also worked on syphilis, so treponema, um, different types of treponema diseases. We did work on tuberculosis and its evolution, especially in the new world after contact. Um, we did work on other pathogens that were introduced into the new world uh, by the Spaniards in the 16th century, like for example, typhoid fever. And we also recently had the chance to work together with um, the Iceman Museum to work on the stomach content of the Iceman, and we could reconstruct Helobacter pylori, which was really exciting that it was still preserved in the frozen stomach of the Iceman. We also work on ancient viruses, and so not just on ancient, um, path uh, ancient uh, bacterial genomes. Um, one should say that uh, viruses are often not well preserved because there are RNA viruses, like coronavirus, for example, that doesn't preserve because RNA doesn't preserve, but there's also DNA virus. And this is an example of a study we just published on a hepatitis B virus, which is a DNA virus, where we reconstructed uh, hundreds of genomes of ancient um, HPV viruses uh, from the last 10,000 years and could then reconstruct the evolution of HPV, um, how it probably emerged in East Asia into the human population and then how it changed through time and kind of seeing kind of the disappearance and appearance of new strains and recombinations that created new strains and um, uh, even some that survived over 7,000 years uh, quite unchanged and just re-emerged in uh, HIV patients of, of, out of all people. Um, so it was a really interesting um, kind of uh, endeavor to, to look at that and we are kind of continuing that work now um, with, with, with this um, HPV other evolution. But today really the focus should be plague. Um, and uh, plague itself is actually not a good example of a human disease because it's actually a rodent disease. It's, it's something you find in wild rodent populations. And from those wild rodent populations, it, 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 it gets basically transmitted into um, animals that live uh, in close proximity with humans. So say if a wild rodent uh, gets infected, they usually get infected by fleas. Um, fleas um, are the vector that transmit the disease. And it's actually quite a nifty mechanism how they transmit the disease. So a flea, if it bites and infects an individual, it takes the bacteria into its, uh, uh, its uh, pre-gut. And there um, they form a biofilm uh, that then serves as a blockage. So it blocks the stomach of the flea. So then if the flea wants to bite again and swallow the blood, it cannot swallow the blood. The blood comes in contact with the biofilm, but then it has to spit it out again because it cannot swallow it. And by spitting it out, it spits out more bacteria. So then it basically spits the bacteria into the, into the bite mark. And by that, transmitting it potentially to another individual. And then the flea gets crazy because it's starving. It doesn't get basically a blood meal. So it keeps on biting. So it bites again and again and again and again, and then really transmits the disease more efficient. After two weeks, it dies. But by that time, it has infected a lot of um, um, host um, animals or other humans. So then rodents die. Um, the fleas might jump to animals that are close proximity to humans, like you know domestic animals, especially also rats and mice, um, that are supposed to be kind of the main then also um, reservoir population, where it then jumps into the humans. 
So also then if humans get uh, bitten, the bacteria then travel through the lymph system into the lymph nodes. Um, in the lymph nodes, um, they cause an infection that kind of turns the lymph node big. It becomes a bubo. That's why it's called bubonic plague. Um, and then through the lymph system, they also travel into the organs um, and uh, cause multi-organ failure, necrosis. Hands and feet turn black. That's why it was called the Black Death in medieval time. And about 50% of all the people that get infected, not treated uh, with antibiotics, that die of the disease within 10 to 20, 20 days. So that's roughly... Uh, uh, kind of the, the time period that it takes. Um, and it's, it's basically sepsis that, that it's causing and that, that it's kind of killing people by. And that's the bubonic form. There's also another form of plague, which is called pneumonic. And pneumonic plague is when people have bubonic plague, they get sepsis, they get an infected lung, and then they cuff out particles of the lung with, with the bacteria, and somebody else inhales them, they get directly the bacteria into their lung, and that causes pneumonic plague. And pneumonic plague is actually even more severe. Mortality is more than 95%, and it's very, very rapid. So it often then spreads within two days and kills people. So um, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really kind of high mortality even today. This is also why plague is currently getting monitored by a lot of defense ministries all over the world, because it has been used in the past as a bioweapon, and there's always the kind of risk that it could be used again as a bioweapon. Um, say if somebody sprays it into like a public subway or something like that. It's still found all over the world today. Um, so you see even in, in Saudi Arabia, you have uh, wild rodent populations um, that, that carry Asenia pastis, uh, but you also have it in all other continents in the world. It's mostly found in Central Asia, uh, but in the 19th century, it was then also brought into other parts uh, of the world. Um, fortunately, there's powerful antibiotics, so we should be afraid of it today as much as we were in the past. Um, but if it's untreated, mortality is, is, is super high. So about half of the people that get infected uh, then die. Historically, there have been three pandemics that we think were caused by Yersinia pestis. And in fact, we don't know at least that the Yersinia pestis was present um, uh, during that time period. So first of all, was the Justinianic plague, the first plague pandemic that started in the sixth century and lasted for about 250 years until it disappeared. Um, then there's a second plague pandemic that started with the Black Death, um, something I will talk more about today, um, and then lasted until the 18th century in Europe, um, then disappeared again, mysteriously. We don't know quite why, but it did. And then there's the Hong Kong plague, uh, which is at the middle to the end of the 19th century, which is also the time when the bacteria actually get discovered by Alexander Yersin, who was sent there by Pasteur to research this mysterious disease in Hong Kong. And he already found this whole kind of flea transmission and reconstructed that whole mechanism. Um, and that is also responsible for the presence of plague all over the world today. So uh, at the time, Hong Kong was a major harbor and uh, the rats that were the main reservoir at the time um, are ship rats. Um, and they were on ships and steamships and they really then uh, transported to the Americas. That's why you find it in, in, in the United States today or to South America, to the Pacific, but also to places like Madagascar, for example, or East, East Africa. Um, the main focus of our work over the last few years has been the Black Death. And that was mostly because it was, first of all, the biggest pandemic we know of in human history, but also one that was enigmatic at the time. Because 10 years ago, when we started that research, there was much debate what had caused it. There was some people saying it's a virus. Some people said it was a hemorrhagic fever. And there was much, much kind of debate and it wasn't really clear what it is. So that's also why we started our molecular journey. Um, the Black Death itself is this short time period of only five years in the mid of the 14th century. Um, and uh, it has probably caused the lives of about half of all Europeans in that short time period. And uh, it has been suggested that it originated in China, just based on kind of historical reconstructions. It was supposed to have come from the East. Um, and China was thought to have been the origin because that's where you find a lot of genetic diversity today. Meanwhile, we do know that the similar divert, uh, diversity we also find in Mongolia and in Kazakhstan. So the modern data doesn't really speak exactly where it originated. And in a few minutes, you will actually see that it was probably not China, but not too far away from China. From Europe, we do know that the kind of historical reconstructions really have this Eastern um, emergence. The oldest historical records we have from, from Kaffa um, suggests that it originated 
um, doing uh, the kind of battles um, around the city of Kaffa. There was a siege, and during the siege, the people that were besieging the city were in fact catapulting dead bodies into the city. And it said that from the dead bodies, um, the disease spread. Kaffa itself was a Genoese colony. The Genoese had to retreat on ships, and they brought it from ships to Constantinople, Messina, Genoa, and Marseille. And then in the next year, it spread further and further and further and over the five year period all over Europe. And it had been suggested that Yesenia Pestis had caused it in the past, but then again, people have questioned it. So we really wanted to see if we can find it, but also study its evolution. Fortunately, we had access to a nice collection from London at the time, from the 14th century, from the East Smithfield Cemetery that was only used in the Black Death. Um, there had so many dead bodies, um, and they disposed them in that place. Uh, we then looked for plague DNA in those, and we could indeed find with PCR plague DNA is there. But we wanted to go one step further and reconstruct the genome of that ancient strain. And that's a bit challenging. I mean, especially 10 years ago, now things became a bit easier over the last 10 years. And you have heard maybe Anand uh, last week uh, talking about plant uh, genomes and pathogens and all that stuff, ancient plants. Um, and in fact, with Anand uh, at the time, we also worked on plague. Um, and uh, what we then used is, is, is what we call um, uh, in solution capture, so hybridization capture approaches where we take the DNA that you can get from an ancient specimen, which is quite a soup of DNA, only a tiny proportion of that DNA is from the person itself that died hundreds of years ago. And even a smaller proportion is the pathogen that has killed the person. So it's really hard to get the little bit of DNA that you're interested in. So with capture approaches like DNA um, uh, capture arrays, we make use of the fact that two DNA strands, if they're complementary, they will attract each other and bind to each other. So if we have single-stranded DNA on, on a glass slide on an array, and you can design that by now millions of different of DNA strands on 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 a, on a, on, a, on, a, on a basically a glass array, um, you you can now basically have the whole genome of a organism present on that on that array and incubate it with the DNA that you get from an ancient uh, sample. So everything that looks similar, and similar means 90% or so sequence identity, it will bind to the surface of the piece of glass. And everything that's not similar, you can basically wash away. Um, and that's quite powerful. It really enriches for the DNA that you're interested in. You then put it in the sequencer and get uh, high throughput sequencing done. And this is just the enrichment efficiency you can see here. And you can really see it's like several hundred fold enrichment. So that means you have to sequence several hundred fold less and you get several hundred fold more um, sequences. And that worked quite well for this for this uh, first study here. It was enough to give us almost a whole genome of that um, ancient Yersinia pastor strain, so 30x coverage, which means we have seen an average every position about 30 times. So really good quality DNA. And you can do, do things like basically family trees of plague. You can then see how does ancient plague relate to modern plague. What you see here is the modern plague family tree. So this is how modern plague looks like in the world today. We have four major branches and some kind of, kind of deeper branches that are called branch zero, and those are called branch one, two, three, and four that comprise, uh, comprise about 80% of the genetic diversity of, of plague in the world today. And then the first question was, how does ancient plague compare to modern plague? And not so surprisingly, we found that the medieval plague from the Black Death actually falls in this position in the genome, uh, in this position in the phylogenetic tree, it falls basal to this branch one, and only a few mutations away from the common ancestor of branch one, two, three, and four, which is 80% of the genetic diversity found in the world today. Why do I say it's not surprisingly? It's because it's very much like we have during the corona pandemic where we had the kind of wild type strain and that gave rise to a lot of different versions, right? To the alpha, beta, delta, omicron, kind of, high whatever's coming in the future, but basically all goes back to kind of Wuhan, kind of like those original strains that uh, emerged in the uh, late 2019. And the same is here, that basically this is the origin of the Black Death, and then it gave rise to, you know, those different uh, strains. And it makes a lot of sense that if this is kind of the beginning of this pandemic, that the London strain falls very close to that uh, beginning. We have then done a lot of work on post Black Death, what happened after the Black Death, because plague was around for several hundred years in Europe, and we have looked at many different sites, we constructed many different genomes from, from different places in Europe from the centuries after the Black Death. That was largely done by Maria Spirou. So, um, despite the Black Death, 
genome from London. She also got a few black death samples from that time period of that major first pandemic. Um, so basically like, a, you know, after Wuhan kind of, uh, if you take the corona metaphor again. Um, and those were from different parts of Europe. They're from Spain, France, and Germany. She also got one genome um, from Russia, which was actually from um, just before the Black Death. And it's really cool in the phylogenetic tree, you can actually see that, um, that is from, from Eastern Europe and it actually falls one mutation basal to the Black Death from London. Um, and it's interesting because it's not too far away from Kaffa and from Crimea. So this whole idea about coming from Eastern Europe through the Mediterranean route is actually supported by, by the molecular evidence here. Those are now the genomes that she had from, from different parts of Europe from the Black Death. And if you actually look where they fall in the phylogenetic tree, you actually see they fall in the same spot like the London strain. And indeed, the strains from Barcelona, from Germany, from France, from London, all from the Black Death are 100% identical in their genome. So unlike what we have you know, for Corona now, which is an RNA virus that evolves much faster, this is a bacterial genome that does not mutate as fast. So basically all those 50 million people that died of the Black Death died of a clone, of an identical clone. So the bacteria didn't have enough time to evolve. They didn't change in the three, four, five years of that major pandemic. They're all 100% genetically identical, which is in itself quite interesting. So it was not multiple things. It was not lots of diversity. It's all the same thing. What's also remarkable is that this is literally the common ancestor of all this diversity that's found in the world today. That also means it doesn't have anything, not a single base, not a single gene that is unique to that ancient pathogen that is not found in the daughters, basically in the strains you find in the world today. You find the Grand Canyon, you find Madagascar, you find in Central Asia. So it also tells us that the phenotype probably hasn't changed. It's not more lethal. It's not that the Black Death was like a super lethal strain that was, you know, like spreading like wildfire because it was biologically adapted to be much faster, more efficient or a bigger killer or anything like that. It also means that all the strains that are around today, at least the ones that fall on branch one, if you catapult them back in time, they would cause the Black Death again. So it's basically still around. So what you find today in the Grand Canyon or what you find today in Madagascar or what you find today in Kazakhstan in the, in the steppes is still the same thing like the Black Death. It really hasn't changed, which was also one of the major kind of, um, uh, kind of results of that type of work. Um, Adia then also looked at the number of strains from the time after the Black Death. Um, and uh, the ones from the late 14th century are quite interesting because on this kind of branch here, on this kind of phylogeny, on the family tree, they are slightly derived from the Black Death. And they're falling like a bit like pearls on a string towards this branch one. And they're all in Europe. So this is kind of London again. This is uh, from the second uh, plague in London from the, uh, from 19, uh, from the 30s, uh, 60s. Uh, this is from Bulgar City, from, from kind of late 14th century, from Eastern Europe. So it really seems that there are those mutations happening within Europe, which also is interesting because this is the branch, this is the version that spreads in the 19th century, the one that causes the Hong Kong plague, the one that you find in Madagascar today, that you find in in the Grand Canyon today. That's the one that has basically emerged out of China in the 19th century all over the world then. Um, but it seems to have originated and slowly evolved in Europe. It also means that it has probably traveled back to Asia eventually. Um, so that was also kind of like almost mind boggling that, that this thing has not, you know, been in kind of evolving in, in Asia and then spreading in the 19th century from there, but actually took a bit of a detour through Europe as it seems. And then there's a number of strains that she has found from the 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th century that are all on this branch that we call the post-Black Death branch. So it basically comes out of the Black Death. So the Black Death comes to Europe and it evolves into very different strains. There's quite a lot of genetic diversity getting born after the Black Death. Again, it's like Corona, where you had the wild type strain that gave rise to Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Omicron, and so forth. We see the same here. But it's all lost diversity because it's not around in Europe much today anymore. Instead of Eastern Europe, then it's, it's, it's a little bit, but basically this genetic diversity that was found in medieval Europe, early modernity is gone. It's an extinct branch. There's also some of the latest ones before it disappeared um, are quite interesting because if you look at their genome, so this is just a genome comparison where you have the different chromosomes in the middle of the Black Death, and then you have different ancient genomes. The ones that you have here in, in red and in blue 
are from London 17th century and uh, from Marseille 18th century, they have a they have a deletion here. There's a whole chunk missing. 50,000 base pairs are missing, and the genes that are missing are partially um, also virulent genes. So we think that these strains at the end of the pandemic were less virulent. So it seems to have lost a little bit of the virulence. That's something that people have suggested for all kind of pathogens. Some people even say it now for Omicron, that it basically became less virulent because it doesn't want to kill us fast. I kind of don't believe that for Corona, and we can discuss about that more. Uh, but people have observed that for other pathogens as well. So also syphilis, for example, that was kind of like a lethal pandemic in the 15th century, 16th century. And then it became more kind of like a chronic infection, uh, which is still very nasty, but it didn't kill as many people as it did in the 16th century. So we could kind of reconstruct that model for the time period, so the post-Black Death, that we have the emergence in Eastern Europe, that then comes to Europe and then evolves into many different lineages, which also means there's a reservoir, there's an animal where it hangs out for 300, 400 years. It's not a reintroduction. That's a model that other people have suggested that plague always came in you. It doesn't seem to be the case. It comes in once and it stays in Europe and it emerges again and again within kind of local context, but it's actually from Europe. It's not introduced because then you would have new strains coming, but it's all part of that kind of Western Eurasian diversity. And it seems to travel back also with this 14th century strain that then gives rise to the, to the 19th century Hong Kong pandemic. So it's it really that Europe, Western Eurasia played an extremely important role for the evolution of Yersinia pestis over the last uh, thousand years. So one kind of puzzle that was missing over the last few years is the origin of the Black Death. Um, and that is something that, that Maria took on over the last few years. And that's kind of this unpublished work that's really I'm quite excited about and um, has just been uh, accepted in nature, it will probably come out in the next couple of weeks. Um, and there we really wanted to address the question, where did the plague originate before it came to Europe? So the Black Death, especially in the 14th century. And there has been many hypotheses. Some people say it's from Eastern Europe. Some people say it's from Southern Europe. Some people said it's from the Caucasus. Other people said it's from Uzbekistan, Central Asia, East Asia, um, Northeastern Asia, and so forth. So there has been many, many different hypotheses um, around. And uh, we have access to a very interesting site. Uh, Phil Slavin, an historian, had tracked down a very interesting collection of gravestones and skeletons from an excavation that was done in the 19th century. And um, people excavated material in what is today Kyrgyzstan, very close to the capital of Kyrgyzstan, Bishkek, and a site that's called Karadijah. And this site is actually amazing because it has gravestones with writing on them. And they say when the person died, and they say that the person died of plague, which we don't have from medieval Europe. We never have a gravestone saying this person died of the Black Death. But here we have it. The word pestilence is actually used on those gravestones. And it says this person died in October 1338, for example. So we're really lucky and really happy that we could, in fact, shrek down the skeletons from the collection in St. Petersburg and could look for plague DNA in them. Um, first thing that we did notice that actually Phil already noticed before was that when you look at the skeletons and look at the kind of basic cemetery from the time and on, on the tombstones and look when they have died, um, that's actually the, the years here. You can see, you know, how many people died in each year. There's this huge accumulation in 1338. A lot of people died in 1338, which is only eight years before the Black Death in Europe. So there was already an indication maybe something happened in 1338, 1339. We then looked at plague and we were lucky. We did indeed find plague in those, in those individuals. And, and Maria, again, could actually reconstruct um, entire genomes of those ancient plague strains. And then here is the phylogeny again. This is the family tree again. Where do they fall? Maybe not a bit surprised. Maybe you already can anticipate where it does fall. It does fall exactly on that point what is the origin of those four major branches. So it's not falling here where we have this Eastern European strain. It's not falling there where we have the European Black Death, this kind of really big like the kind of event that happened in Europe. It actually falls on the note where those four major branches diverge from each other. So it's really, if you want, that is the Wuhan of plague, yeah, of the Black Death. That is really where it emerged, basically the strain that is the most recent common ancestor of large part of the genetic diversity today and of those four major branches within the plague um, 
phylogeny. So it's basically, yeah, if you want patient zero or something like that, but as close as it goes to patient zero, it's literally the common ancestor genome that we have discovered here. And it's also really cool. Um, so it falls here in the phylogeny. We have been also looking at some of the rodent strains that have been um, sequenced and analyzed uh, from this part of the world. Um, and you can actually see that there is some close relative strains that are found in the genetic diversity today that have been isolated from rodents. And you see the blue one here and the red one here, they're from this region here. This is Isikul, this is a big lake in Kyrgyzstan. This is where those uh, have been found. So you have even today the wild rodent populations that are the closest relatives to the strain that we then see emerging here. So we probably even think that this is what gave them rise. The, those rodents, those marmots, um, and, and other rodents that you have your groundhogs in the region. Um, we don't know which one, but one of them probably then gave rise to the strains that then kind of emerged for the first time in humans and then spread um, throughout uh, Western Eurasia and later on even the world. So with that particular study, um, we can say uh, the Karadija uh, is the common ancestor, which is really exciting for branches one to four. So it's the kind of mother of the, of the Black Death, if you want. Um, we have all this likely region and time frame of the source of the second plague pandemic. Um, and uh, the West World dispersal therefore happened after 1338 because the gravestone says this person died in 1338. We have that strain. And that in itself is very exciting to historians because historians have actually thought that the Black Death emerged in the 11th century, 12th century. There's a lot of literature on that, but nobody thought it happened just a few years before 1346 when it comes to Europe. But it's really, it's just this eight year period, right? It took like eight years from the emergence in Kyrgyzstan to then make it all its way um, into Europe and then within four or five years spread all over Western Eurasia. This is in a way the story of the historical pandemics. And that's where we did a lot of work on. We also worked on the Justinianic plague and I don't have time to, to talk about that today. But one thing I wanna to talk today about a bit still is kind of looking further back in time because that is what we know from history. But what about prehistory? What about time periods where we don't have any records? Like what, what happened there? And that's a bit more difficult because if you don't know what to look for, you also don't know what to capture. So if there's no historical record that tells you, look for plague or look for leprosy or look for syphilis, I would have to look for everything. And this capturing that I kind of showed you where we use this rays or intrusion capture or something like that, we have to have some prior knowledge, which we often don't have. So therefore we have to take a different strategy for the unknown for kind of moving back in time. And there we use what we call a shotgun approach. So basically we just look at every DNA fragment that we can get from an ancient skeleton. Sounds easy, is however not so easy because unfortunately the machines are too productive. If we have an ancient skeleton and we press the right button, we get billions of DNA sequences per day from that ancient skeleton. And it would take with kind of algorithms that were available to us a few years ago, like Megablast or something, it would take years to analyze such a data set. So, Basically, the machines have increased by one order of magnitude per year in their throughput, but the computers have only doubled in their computer power. So actually, the, the, the sequencing machines have become too powerful in a way, uh, which creates really a problem. So therefore, people had to develop new algorithms. And we are very fortunate that we could work together with, with, with uh, Daniel Husson from Tübingen University and Alexander um, with a new um, algorithm that's called MOLD, Megan Alignment Tool. It's a metagenomic um, um, analysis tool, which you can basically feed a database to, for example, all the genomes of the world that have been kind of reconstructed so far, which is maybe like 30, 50, 30, 40,000, all the bacterial genomes, whatever you choose. And then you can use your sequencing data. So whatever kind of uh, uh, sequencing data set you have. Um, and then it really does an alignment in, in a very smart way. Um, and it's really fast. And that's really the power of that tool. It's much faster than, than, than tools like, like BLAST that have been developed before. It's about 300 to 400 times faster when we did a power comparison. And that, that really then allows us to process up to 1 billion DNA reads per day and assign them to different species. Um, and we had then a, a postdoc and a student in the lab um, that then extended that pipeline um, uh, two years ago and uh, did some kind of processing and kind of more filtering because you get a lot of reads assigned to a lot of different bacterial species that could be pathogens or not, that could be ancient or not. And with this kind of what's called malt extract and this new pipeline we call HOPS, uh, so heuristic uh, operations for pathogen screening, we can now then assign reads 
to species and then say, is it ancient DNA or not? Um, and by that, we actually reduced the number of hits quite a lot. And we found some really interesting ones. Um, so in this first study, then we screened about 3,000 um, skeletons for the presence of um, ancient uh, pathogen DNA. And what we found, and that was a big surprise then at the time, was that plague was already around in prehistory. Um, the oldest one that has been reconstructed so far is more than 5,000 years old. The oldest one we reconstruct is about exactly uh, 5,000 years old. Um, so there now from, from multiple also other labs, um, largely also from our lab, uh, we have now pathogen genomes from all over the world, uh, or all over Eurasia, I should say, um, from, from, from the last uh, few thousand years from, from prehistory. Um, and that, that's really exciting. Um, it's a really different type of, of plague though. If you put it in the uh, phylogenetic tree, um, it actually falls outside of the genetic diversity we have in plague today. So this is the Black Death. This is basically you know, where the origin of the Black Death was. This is just the plague I've just mentioned, but this is where it would fall in comparison to the Black Death. This is the genetic diversity found in the plague today in Yersinia pestis. And this is the prehistoric plague, what we call late stone age plague. So really talking about 5,000 to about uh, 3,000 years ago. And it forms its own branch in the phylogeny. There's also some even kind of deeper divergent strains here from Sweden that were found in another study. And it really is different to this type of plague, not just in the phylogeny, um, it's also different as you will see in a moment um, in its genome. What you can then also observe, and that's something that we're still struggling with. And I'm actually very happy about, you know, people that have ideas why it is like it is, is that the whole phylogenetic tree of Stone Age plague looks quite different in a way that you have a strain that evolves into another strain that evolves into the next 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 strain. So what I want to say is that there is a backbone here. And this is from this study in 2017. We have another study that's coming out in a couple of weeks in PNAS, where we have now more than 30 ancient strains from Stone Age plague. And they're all connected through a backbone, but they are always a new strain that gives rise to a new strain that gives rise to a new strain. So it's not like we see in modern plague where you have a certain amount of diversity, here you have a backbone. And it really looks like out of this reservoir or backbone population, strains are spreading within the human population, then they disappear and then a new one comes and then they disappear and then a new one comes and then they disappear. And it has done that 40, 50 times, but there was always the backbone, which means somewhere in Eurasia, there's some place where there is a reservoir of Stone Age plague that spills over into humans hundreds of times probably over the 3000 year period. It's really bizarre. It's really funny because there must be some place somewhere where it basically kind of contracts and then kind of uh, diversifies and kind of spreads again. And it's really, it's, we don't understand what it is because it's not multiple rodent population because then you would have multiple strains like we have a plague today where you know all those strains are found in different rodents. And that really seems to have one place and it would be really cool and interesting to find out what it is because that would also help us to understand the disease. What it also allows us is to do some sort of kind of migration of it because we now know this is the oldest one and out of that came somehow the two and out of that came then the next oldest one which is three of that then the four and then the five and the six and the seven and you kind of get this kind of you know movement over kind of time and space which looks interesting um if you will only have that i would probably not make a big kind of story out of it but what's really amazing is that this type of movement that you see here, where a population from the North Caucasus spreads into the East and spreads into the West, and then there's this kind of spread back into Central Asia, that's exactly what we have um, reconstructed over the last few years from human migrations. Humans also migrated the same way. There's the so-called Yamnaya expansion, where you have this expansion of people from Southern Russia into the East, into the Altai Mountains, into Central Europe, probably also spreading with it horse, wheel, and wagon, and Indo-European languages. So it's a very interesting package, and you might have read about that already. And it really seems to resemble the, the spread of the plague. So it really seems to follow human migration. So probably somehow in some domestic animal, or maybe in humans, but maybe spread by humans. Even. And what's really remarkable about Stone Age plague is it has a large chunk missing in its genome compared to modern day plague. And the chunk that is missing is actually genes that are necessary for plague 
to live in fleas. So this type of bacteria would have not been able to live within the stomach of a flea. It could have not been transmitted by fleas. It would have killed the flea or the flea would have killed it. So it lacks six virulence genes that are necessary for flea transmission. So therefore it couldn't cause bubonic plague because it couldn't be transmitted by fleas by kind of biting fleas. So it's not bubonic plague. It then leaves two other possibilities. So septicemic plague, those people died, that they died of sepsis. So it has somehow entered the bloodstream, how? So some sort of sepsis, but then, you know, how did it get in? We don't know. Or pneumonic plague. We also have cases of pneumonic plague in the 19th and 20th century that are quite rare. Maybe they were more common at the time. Maybe where people were living in very close proximity in tents and they were coughing at each other and by inhaling basically, you know, other people's coughed out uh, uh, lung uh, pieces, <laughs> they might have infected themselves so that it was not bubonic, but it was pneumonic plague that was actually spreading at the time. And therefore, that also kind of looks like follows human migrations because it's humans themselves picking it up somewhere and then uh, basically transmitting it within the human population. What we also have, which we're also quite excited about right now, is that we have now some bubonic strains from the time that is not too far away from, from this kind of a strange other type of plague. Um, so the oldest one we now have is from 3,800 years ago, um, again from Southern Russia, that falls now on kind of the, the, the tree of modern diversity, basal actually to much of the diversity today. But if you look at its genome, it doesn't have that gap. It does have that kind of insertion probably, we would call it now, um, of those virulence genes. So it has all the genes necessary for bubonic plague. So it basically has a number of genes adaptations that have evolved after Stone Age plague and this type of plague diverged from each other. Um, so within a thousand years, probably 5,000 to 4,000 years, all those genes necessary for flea transmission were there. So this, this strain, as far as we can say, has the same type of uh, kind of mortality as the same type of potential. Genetically, it looks like bubonic plague we have in the Black Death or Justinianic plague, or we have in Madagascar or other places um, in the world today. So it was probably highly contagious and was transmitted by fleas. Um, and that seems to have been already around 4,000 years ago. Question that we have is why didn't it cause a pandemic at the time? Maybe it did, we just don't have any historical records about it. So what can we then really say? Um, so Yersinia pestis has been one of the causative agents of at least the three historical pandemics. We have no molecular evidence. We're quite confident with that. The Black Death genome itself, we were really surprised about, shows only very small differences to modern strains, about 90 in the whole genome, and is the common ancestor. So it doesn't have anything special, no gene, no position in the genome. So it's really um, nothing special. It just means modern strains are like the Black Death. Um, what's also cool that we now have found likely where it origins, uh, or, or originated in the foothills of the Tian Shan Mountains, so in modern day Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan, probably in the 1330s. I mean, we have gravestones with person died of plague on it. So that's, that's really cool. It's, you know, how, as good as a date you can get when, when, when it's even written what the person died of. Um, the fleet transmission itself evolved within the last 4,000 years, which is also interesting that we can narrow that down. So then suddenly you have bubonic plague about you know, 4,000 years ago. Um, what happened then at that time? So there's a lot of historical things, of course, that can happen that you might be able in the future to link um, to the spread of plague. Um, you have epidemic outbreaks of plague in prehistory, which is also interesting for archeologists especially. So it's not just in the historical times where we now have found what caused them, but also maybe we find big events in prehistory that we don't know of because we don't have history, but now we can actually write history maybe with, with kind of, you know, a senior pestis um, phylogeny. So we can reconstruct, for example, an epidemic or pandemic event in prehistorical times. Um, and of course they had an influence on, on human migration. So this whole Bronx age movement of people that I showed you moving to the East, moving to the West, a lot of speculation has been, why did it happen? And some people say, maybe it was the plague. Maybe it was, you know, there were large pandemics. We see a lot of mobility um, around time periods where you have uh, diseases spreading. And it could just be that local populations collapsed and other people came in or the people that came in were more immune or there's lots of speculation now, but it for the first time really puts pathogens on our radar as a potential contributor to prehistoric migrations, which was not available to us before, but is available now thanks to ancient DNA.
And then, yeah, we had the earliest evidence for body plague already in the Middle Bronze Age. So going back almost 4,000 years, which is actually much deeper than we thought it was uh, present within human populations. So by that, I want to thank all the people that did the fantastic work I talked today about, especially Kirsty Alexander's group leaders and Maria Marcel, Adam Michalis, postdocs or PhD students, and the rest of my department, uh, lots of funding agencies and collaboration partners. If you want to read more about that, uh, my first book from 2019 is also available in English called A Short History of Humanity, um, but it's also available in many other languages. Um, so if you want to hear a bit more about ancient pathogen history and ancient human history, um, yeah, then there is some literature on that. So um, by that, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take um, any questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Johannes, for that uh, amazing tour de force of um, uh, ancient human pathogen genetics. Um, I can see there's a, a, a virtual uh, uh, hand of uh, applause going around. Um, okay, so let's uh, open it for discussion and questions. Um, and as usual, we'll, we'll start with uh, early career scientists. So uh, PhD students, master students, postdocs, and, and then we'll we'll move on to um, if, if 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 group leaders and so on want to join the discussion. So, any students out there who'd like to ask the first question? Come on, guys! There must be okay, Alicia. Uh, hi, thank you so much for the very interesting talk. I have kind of maybe unrelated question in terms of ancient DNA. It's more related to this, to uh, current um, epidemics. Uh, so in, uh, in my region uh, in Italy, so the Northeast of Italy, uh, lately we have, um, we have seen a lot of avian flu that caused like many outbreaks that caused the poultry to be uh, cooled. And this actually uh, caused a very uh, high economic impact. But also, of course, there's, all, uh, there's always the, the risk for the avian flu to become a zoonosis. Uh, so my question is, do you think that uh, in case of livestock and poultry in this case would be uh, would be useful would be like is there any urgency for breeders to select poultry or livestock whose receptors are kind of as far as possible for human receptors that may be like the um, like the the key for the virus in this case to jump from one species to the other and become and become a zoonosis it's a it's a very interesting proposal you're making there. I have never thought about it myself. I'm not an influenza specialist at all because it's an RNA virus and there's a huge research field uh, studying um, RNA. We can also now do ancient RNA, but then we're really talking about the last hundred years. So there's also Spanish flu, for example, that has been reconstructed to influenza from the 1918 or 1919. Um, so the suggestion you make uh, is, is interesting to say, if you could say study MHC of um, certain uh, species and see if you could actually select um, animals that have uh, maybe MHC molecules that are, or other entry molecules. I don't know actually what influenza uses. Um, uh, so on the one hand, you would have the kind of immune system um, of, of those um, animals that, that, you know, you could think, select, you could select that is more immune, but I think that's kind of naturally done by certain kind of population to survive uh, certain mm -hmm. outbreaks. But then if you would have um, things like, you know, CCR5 is a good example, a chemokine receptor that is used by HIV to enter into our um, T cells. Um, if, if you have a mutation there, then you're immune against HIV. And that's a very common mutation in Europeans uh, today. Um, so if you would have some mutation like that, uh, uh, or some difference between, say, uh, birds and uh, humans, um, it, it could really uh, protect us. 
The problem with uh, influenza to some degree is that's also why it's so successful that it does recombine easily with many different types of uh, other influenza like swine or human. Um, and that's really what, what, what makes it so dangerous that you get those recombinant strains that, you know, like in, in, in one, H1 the swine flu in 2009 that had, you know, elements from bird, from human, from, 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 pig, uh, from swine. Um, and in a way, it could easily happen that, you know, you might select for, you know, one mechanism that then kind of recombines with a human uh, strain that, that kind of then evolves away from that mechanism. So you spend a lot of time evolving or kind of developing, you know, say, birds uh, that are different, but then it still kind of um, might evolve into a different direction. That said, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, approach. It's a bit similar to what people do for mosquitoes in in, um, in, in East Africa, where they develop those genetic tra traps, where they become basically through time um, less fertile. Um, and that's kind of still has a natural selection advantage that outweighs the kind of infertility and kind of spreads within those populations mm -hmm. and then might reduce the mosquitoes that cause malaria. Um, yeah, but it's interesting. I think it's, it's, it's maybe, maybe some of you are biotechnologists, so <laughs> it should be that right along your alley uh, and uh, you should develop it further. I think it's a great idea. Thank you very much. We've got a question in the chat box from Leonardo. Um, do, Leonardo, do you want to 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 join and, and and read it out? If not, I I can. I have also read it. I can also read it. So it's the question: okay. um, What do I mean when uh, uh, Yersinia pestis evolves to use as a flea transmission vector only recently? Um, that yeah, indeed, that's kind of what we find now. So. Um, the piece of information is that the prehistoric plague that we have analyzed from 5,000 years ago does not have the genes necessary for flea transmission. The mechanisms how it's transmitted by fleas are well understood and studied. There's a number of genes like YMT, for example, or urase um, A or D that are necessary for survival of bacteria inside the stomach of a flea that are not yet present, they're not yet evolved, they're not yet changed, or even the whole cassette where the gene is on is absent in those prehistoric strains. And it's an insertion that happens between four and 5,000 years ago. So therefore our conclusion is that those strains could have not been transmitted because they would have killed the flea or the flea had, has digested them, or they could have not made the biofilm that is necessary for the transmission. So all those mechanisms are not there. So therefore, we say it has only evolved then. So what it was before, we do not know. How was it transmitted? Lots of speculation. We do know that the pseudotuberculosis, which is the closest living relative of plague, is causing gastrointestinal effects. So you can actually eat it and kind of uptake it through, through consumption. Um, and uh, that's in an environment, so it's an environmental bacterium. So it could be that this was also gastrointestinal. So in fact, it was more like typhoid fever or like uh, cholera, and it was not uh, transmitted by fleas. Um, so it's indirect. Uh, if you would really want to know, you would have to rebuild it and infect some animals and see how it works. Uh, but kind of from the reconstruction, it should not work if, because the genes are not there. The machinery is not uh, present in those ancient strains. Okay, thanks. Thanks again for the talk. Sure. Okay, Mohammed. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the very wonderful talk. It was very, very interesting. Now, I'd just like to ask you two quick quick questions. The first question is, um, since the COVID, we have seen a lot more money being spent on um, health research. Do you see the, the trickle-down effect of that into the research funding available for you? And then the second question I have is, um, you're part of this very prestigious institution, the Max Planck, which has a different model than traditional universities. Um, what sort of um, the advantages has that given you in your ability to do excellent research, the model which the Max Planck Institute provide you? Thank you. Yes, thank you for those questions. Um, so for the first question, has it trickled down yet? 
I can't say so, but I have also not asked for it. <laughs> so I can really say that for myself, I needed, you know, more resources. As you say, kind of Max Planck is really well funded and it's not that I needed to increase my funding and I'm currently having a large ERC project on historical kind of time period, uh, human uh, genetic history. Um, and I didn't want to ask for another ERC grant. I do know that the whole field of archaeogenetics has received a lot of um, funding over the last couple of years. I have seven group leaders in my department that have an ERC grant, which are usually 1.5 million to up to 10 million euros. So um, funding has been given. And I've also, I'm also aware that other institutions got a lot of money to study ancient pathogens or pathogens in general. There's also a new research center that studies zoonosis, um, what uh, focuses one past health, um, which is uh, being built right now um, as a Helmholtz Institute in, in Germany in, in, in Greifswald. Um, so I do think it happens. If I think about, you know, a monitoring program, which I think is needed in the world right now, we need to monitor the viruses that are out there in animal reservoirs. That's really what we should have. What it would cost, some people estimate it one to two billion. Sounds like a lot of money. On the other hand, the economic impact of the pandemic was in the thousands of billions, right? The trillions of, of, of euros that have been lost in the last couple of years through various things like stock market crash and kind of, you know, uh, you know lots of, uh, of course, vaccination programs and, and other things. So there's a lot of money that, that was wasted. Um, so I hope that stakeholders will consider to fund infectious disease research more in the future because we see what devastating effect even such a tiny little coronavirus could have. And, you know, honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a bad virus. It causes a horrible disease that people die of, but mortality is actually very low, right? It's not like the plague, which is like 50% mortality or something like that. But that something like that could also emerge. Ebola has a mortality of 50%. Um, and there's easily other, other pathogens you could think of. We just talked about influenza. You know, some influenza strains had 20, 30% mortality. Um, so you could easily imagine that something else emerges and we really need to understand it more. And I really hope that that trickles down and there is enough funding for that type of work in the future. The other question about what does Max Planck allow me that the university didn't? I mean, I was at the university for five years having a research group there. Then I was lucky enough to be a founding director of a new Max Planck Institute in Jena. And what it allows me is just to kind of increase my research agenda, of course, because of kind of substantial funding. Um, it gives me therefore the more flexibil uh, flexibility to also kind of do pilot studies and kind of different kind of uh, organisms, for example. Um, and expand kind of just a research portfolio. But it, what it especially does is it kind of frees me from obligations like a lot of politics, lots of uh, committee work, uh, lots of faculty work and a lot of teaching, which I love, I, I love teaching. And, you know, I, I really enjoy to pass on knowledge also to the next generation. But that's also something that we do to PhD students. Um, and uh, it just often takes a lot of time from, from many professors if they, if they have a very uh, a thick uh, cu uh, curriculum, especially if they want to do a good job, then you easily spend half of your time in teaching. Um, and that's basically what, what Max Planck allows you to not do. You can really concentrate on your research. And uh, Max Planck also has the advantage that you have a lot of freedom to choose what you want to do. You can still be a professor. You can still be a politician. You can still be an administrator uh, or a funding agency. Uh, or you're like a scientist. Uh, there's a lot of different models how you can fill uh, those shoes. Um, and that's, I think, also really great. And there's very little administration. So you really have a lot of freedom and flexibility in, in research. It's also, though, meaning that, you know, there's a lot on your shoulders. It's basically, the, as, as one person, you have a lot of freedom, but you have also then, you know, a lot of responsibility. I have currently 120 people in my department that I'm responsible for, which is a large group of people that are all depending to a large degree on kind of, you know, my decisions um, and my governance and my management, uh, which is often different if you have a small group of 10 people. Uh, in a way, you know, I can cause a lot of damage. <laughs> but it's also something that, that, one, that one, of course, has to take into consideration. So if you appoint the wrong people, I think the damage can be huge. Um, and we observe that also, um, obviously, in our society. It's not that we, every decision that we do is right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Monica. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Uh, thank you, Johannes, it was really nice talk. Um, 
I have to say that is completely out of my, uh, my focus because I work with uh, plant stress biology, but it was really interesting. So I have a question which I don't know if it's relevant, but uh, it was curious for me to see that at least in two cases that you show, if it was a bacteria or the virus, within the time there was always a deletion of the chunk of genes happening. Is it a common pattern uh, through the evolution that usually happen? Or you observe also like frequently that there are substitution over the time? I, I showed only the examples of those large scale kind of mutations, if you want, which are those deletions and mutations of larger regions, um, because then really whole genes are lost. Of course, we have also single point mutations, uh, not as many as you might expect, but mm -hmm. the mutation rate is also not so big. And what people underestimate for bacteria is that the mutation rate is, it, I mean, it's much faster than for humans, but it's also not so much faster. And it's not comparable to viruses that have a hundred to thousand times faster mutation rate, especially if they are RNA viruses. So they do evolve also relatively slow. I can say for Yersinia pestis, that has a 4 million base pair genome, you have one mutation per 10 years. Mitochondrial DNA in humans, you have one mutation in 3,000 years, right? I mean, that kind of gives you a bit of a perspective, which is kind of like it's an organelle genome, but still it's much smaller than the whole a nuclear mm -hmm. genome, but still. Um, so it is, a, it is a mutation rate that is maybe 10 times or 100 times um, uh, faster than for humans, but uh, it's, it's still relatively... Um, low, which also means that the whole genetic diversity that's out there of Yersinia pestis is, is actually, it's 99.99% identical, those genomes. So they're actually very, very similar to very recently evolved bacterium. That is quite different to other bacteria. And some other bacteria have a much, much lower mutation rate, like uh, lepre, uh, microorganism lepre has an even lo lower mutation rate uh, that has more like, you know, one mutation in a hundred years. Um, so it's really, really slowly evolving. And some bacteria evolve faster, but you accumulate also single point mutations. But they're often not as deleterious, of course, or as heavy in terms of its impact than if you have a whole 3,000 base pairs or 50,000 base pairs uh, missing or inserted. But we see both insertions deletions. We have also this whole cassette that has the genes that make it bubonic. Um, it's an insertion that happened, you know, four, four to 5,000 years ago. Whereas what happened in this uh, late Black Death that I showed, that's really a deletion. And what's really exciting, I didn't talk about that, the same deletion happens at the end of the first pandemic in the eighth century. So it's the same region that gets deleted. So there is something in that, in that region that then also could be somehow related to the end of the pandemic. So this kind of idea of losing virulence that has been suggested for, for other pathogens as well, that pathogens after a certain while, they become less kind of lethal or less severe um, and then burn out, um, that this could be also something that is that is present um, here in, in Yersinia Okay, thank you very much. It's really interesting. Thank you. Jesse Poland. Hey, Brandy, thanks. You can hear me okay? Yep, yes. perfect. Great. Okay, good. Thanks, uh, Joanna. It's excellent. Really nice talk. I was really fascinated with like reconstructing the lineages as you, you know, went back to the founding strains. And I had a question on, and I might have missed it, so correct me if I'm just wrong, is that you're using like extant genomic information to capture the ancient samples, right? And so based on that capture design, you wouldn't be able to exactly find genomic regions or genes in the ancient samples that are not present in the in the extent you know current ones and that right you showed some really nice examples of deletions basically relative to the current genome but is it possible that you wouldn't have any way to find the opposite right something that was present in the ancient and lost in the in the current ones, and and do you yes. think that impacts the story and the phylogeny at all? Yes, I mean it will not uh, it will not affect the phylogeny because insertions and deletions are not used for phylogenetic tree building because yeah. Yeah. if they're not there, you can't have them in the other, so you can't really build a tree on it. But of course, they could change the biology, and they would you know to yeah. some degree change the kind of conclusions we would make. In the case of the Black Death, we can say 
this is the common ancestor of 80% of the strains circulating in the world today. If the Black Death would have something that those don't have, but it's the mother of them all, it would be a very strange convergent evolution that has been lost in many, many lineages. The same thing. It can happen, but I think it's quite unlikely. So it's very unlikely that this common ancestor had something that was lost everywhere. Um, there can be things that are inserted in lineages um, where we only have, you know, just in any plague, for example, we only have that one shootout. It, it's extinct. It's not there anymore. There's no closer relative there. So that it has something that has gained, which we cannot capture because we don't know that it existed. So let's say it has an extra plasmid um, that the other ones don't have. We wouldn't find it indeed. That's a problem. Um, we have for some genomes uh, done shotgun genomes. So if you sequence deep enough and we have good preservation, we get actually the whole genome. We can do even a de novo assembly. Um, so we don't need the mapping assembly, which is a bias. We don't need the capture, which is also a bias. So those are two biases. In fact, uh, the assembly when we reconstruct is also a bias because you use the reference genome as a template to reconstruct your ancient genome on top of it. It's like a puzzle where you have a picture and you puzzle on top of that picture. If you only use the puzzle pieces, you might get a different picture. Right? Uh, but if you have a template, you kind of know how it looks like. So that's that's yet another bias. But really, the novo assembly and shotgun sequencing is the key. We've done it for a couple of pathogens where we see really good partner preservation, also for Yersinia pestis now. And we haven't found anything where we really missed anything. Still possible that that could happen um, in, in the in the future. Um, but so far, we haven't really. And then again, for the Black Death, I don't really see it as a problem. For the deeper ones, for the kind of for the for the once the Stone Age plague, for example, there it's more of a problem. Fortunately, we also have the outgroups, and we could already see mm -hmm. that if we, if we, for example, um, use the outgroup um, for reconstructing a, a capture, we see insertions on the Yersinia pestis lineage that we then don't get, but we also have deletions on the Yersinia pestis lineage that the, the Stone Age still has, but that is basically deleted on the Yersinia pestis lineage. Um, so those we got because we used the outgroup then as a capture reaction, um, which also works. So it is certainly something that one has to take into um, account and, and, and be, be careful with. In general, ancient genome reconstruction suffers from that problem a lot because the DNA is also highly degraded. So the other problem is with very short DNA, you can actually not map a lot of regions. So for the human genome, for example, like the Neanderthal genome, there's about 30% of the genome we cannot reconstruct because it's repetitive. And we will never be able to reconstruct it because we can only use short reads. So like in the old days, 10 years ago, when we only had Illumina reads for genome reconstruction, now we fortunately have long reads from Oxford Nanopore and kind of many other companies that do long reads. And with those high quality long reads, you can actually span over those regions. But the DNA from the past is so degraded, we can never get very long reads. So that's yet another problem. So we will never have as good quality from the past as we have from the present. Yeah, great. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And um, uh, Mirko, you have a question too. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So first of all, many thanks for your talk. It was really interesting, both from the scientific and historical point of view. So my question is, uh, all the data you showed, are related to the uh, bacterial chromosome or it involved also plasmids? Because we know that plasmids are very useful for bacteria to evolve resistant strain, uh, resistant traits. And if there is a monitoring uh, plan for uh, the emergency of uh, resistance to antibiotics that currently are the only way for, uh, to stop the, the disease, and if there is a risk that um, plasmids can, uh, can uh, lead to the emergence of new traits that can increase the infectivity of the bacteria and start new pandemic with new strains adapting to humans. Yes, so certainly plasmids play a very important role. Mm -hmm. Senior pestis has three plasmids. We study all three of them plus the genome. So we do study plasmids as well. They're part of the genome. Some bacteria also have two chromosomes, not just one. Some have like microchromosomes that are somewhere between a plasmid and a chromosome. So it really depends what you have. And indeed, they're kind of, kind of mobile uh, because they can be um, 
um, basically uh, exchanged between even different species, um, which which happens. We don't know where the plasmids come from that Yersinia pestis has. The closest relative that lives today, Yersinia pseudo tuberculosis, only has one of the three. So two of them came from somewhere, uh, PCP, uh, for example. We don't know where it's from. We have no idea. It hasn't been found anywhere. Um, and one of them carries actually the cassette that is necessary for flea transmission. So it has not just gotten that plasmid, but also that cassette of genes from some recombination with some plasmid or some other chromosome or some other species somewhere. And we don't know where that is coming from either. So that is like, you know, is, we're very, very early in understanding, you know, where kind of genetic diversity in bacteria is coming from sometimes because there's so much bacterial diversity out there that we have no idea how it looks like. I mean, there's billions of bacterial species with billions of kind of genomes and chromosomes and plasmids and we're not even scratching the surface here, right? So um, there's much more to be done. But yeah, absolutely, that is that is a big concern. You know, there's things like cholera toxin, kind of the whole kind of uh, cassette that just emerges within a certain amoeba, and then they become, you know, very pathogenic. Um, but it has to be basically kind of transmitted to them. And that, that happens, of course, with, with other kind of mobile genomic elements. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, we'll take uh, two more questions. Uh, we've got one from uh, Raushan. Raushan, do you want to turn your video on? Hi, um, I'm sorry. Um, it's just like it's a bit crowded here. <laughs> do you mind if I just speak on the microphone? Sure, um, sure. Okay. Thank you for an amazing talk. It's, it was a very interesting uh, presentation and uh, looking forward for the papers to be published. Um, I have a question regarding the disappearance of the plague in the 18th century. Uh, you mentioned that um, then it appeared in Hong Kong, but then what is your like theory of why it disappeared in Europe in the 18th century? That's one of the big mysteries in plague research. Why did it disappear? It disappeared twice in the 8th century and then the 18th century. One hypothesis now that we added was that it genetically changed. It has this deletion. So maybe it became less virulent. That's one hypothesis now. It's kind of, you know, testing could only be done if you rebuild those strains in the lab and kind of see what they do, if they're maybe less infectious. Um, the other thing that has been around for a very long time is what also changed in the 18th century in Europe is the introduction of a new host. So what we think about that transmits the disease on the one hand is fleas, the other thing is rats. And the medieval rat, ratus ratus, called the brown rat, um, has almost gotten extinct in Europe by now. When you come to Europe and you see rats, they're usually not ratus ratus, they're ratus norvegicus, which is the black rat, uh, sorry, I just mixed it up exactly. That's, that's the brown rat, the black rat was the one, ratus ratus, the black rat. In English and German, it's called house rat, so domestic rat, which, which, which is not how it's called in English. So the black rat was the one in the medieval time. And in the 18th century, the brown rat gets introduced to Europe. And the brown rat, wherever it, it emerges, the black rat retreats. So also that's something we see in the Americas right now, but the brown rat was introduced on the East Coast, the black rat on the West Coast, and the brown rat moves for many years now towards the, the, the West Coast. And people expect that once the brown rat population fully emerges in California, the, the, the black rat will be gone because they are really aggressive towards the black rat. They even eat them um, and they replace them. So, um, and the black rat is the one that lives in very close uh, proximity to humans. It's why we call it the house rat in German. It's called, it's called the roof rat in English and the black rat. So it lives under the roof. It lives in houses it's like a mouse almost. It's a large mouse, but it's, it's like a mouse. Uh, it was eating grain. Um, it was living in human habitations, whereas the brown rat lives in sewage. It lives in the underground. Um, and therefore, people think that the transmission is not as likely from the brown rat to the human than from the black rat that lives in your house. Um, and then easily the fleas kind of basically jump from the black rat to the human and not so much from the brown rat. At least that's kind of what people have hypothesized. So we've also said that the fleas, the brown rat fleas and the black rat fleas, they're different species and that the black rat flea is basically a better vector for the pathogen than the brown rat flea. Um, that's also a possibility. Certainly what transmitted the disease in the 19th century is the black rat. That's ratus ratus, the ship rat also. It's called then on steamships has many names, it seems. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a potential explanation for it. Thank you very much.
Okay, and, and if I may take the last uh, one or two questions. Um, one of them was, was actually from Rod. I had the same question in my mind. He had to leave to another meeting. But the question is, where uh, this, this chunk of DNA that allows transmissibility by fleas, uh, where did that come from? Was that some conjugation? Can you look at uh, you know, using BLAST and get an idea where, where, where did it come from? Yeah, we have no idea. We did look for it. It doesn't have homology. There's no organism that has homology to. We don't know. It's true actually for, for, for both for both uh, plasmids and Yersinia pestis uh, that are uh, the PMT and the PCP. They are, they're not there in the closest relative. Um, they have emerged from somewhere, but if you blast them, you don't find homology to other organisms. So it's not really clear. We, we don't know. Okay, and the last question. Um... Have you ever tried to use your captures for, um, I presume you have captures for different diseases uh, on Neanderthal DNA uh, to test this theory that, you know, when we were hunter gatherers a, a few thousand years earlier, uh, we didn't have any of these uh, diseases? Uh, of um, course, a negative result is not conclusive, but. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's the problem. We don't even need to use capture. We can use the shotgun approach that we are now mostly using. Honestly, that's kind of the screening approach now. We're screening everything. We haven't found anything in, in Neanderthals yet. We have found a ton of other things, right? I mean, we're really kind of, you know, like the HPV story I, I showed you with hundreds of genomes of hepatitis B virus from all over the world, and all kinds of skeletons. We have about 20,000 skeletons in house right now, and, and we find a lot of pathogens. For the Neanderthals, we haven't found anything yet. But there can be two reasons. One reason is it's just not preserved, it's too old. Another reason could be we couldn't identify it. If it's a virus, I don't think we can identify it because it's too far evolved. It's too much diverged. If it has 60% sequence identity, how would we find it? The oldest uh, HPV we have is from 10,000 years old. Um, so hepatitis B virus genome. And um, that has only 80% sequence identity with strains that are around today. So 20% kind of, you know, divergence is quite a lot. And that's 10,000 years. And Neanderthal would be half a million years, at least, maybe even more. So, you know, 20 times as much. So you would only have 50% sequence identity. Then you couldn't find it. You can't, cannot, you cannot then use any algorithm because then everything maps to everything, right? So um, for a bacterial species, I think it would work. And in fact, we have Neanderthal um, oral microbiota. So we have from the oral cavity, from, from dental plague, um, and then the calculus, we have uh, DNA from bacteria that were living in Neanderthals more than 100,000 years old. Those are actually some of the oldest bacterial genomes we currently have, but they're not pathogens. They're just uh, basically a, a, a flora. So they're just meta, uh, part of the meta genome and um, of the microbiome. And they're not really uh, pathogenic, but, but those we get. So at least that we can get, but we haven't found any pathogen, but we're looking for it. So who knows? Maybe at some point we find something like plague or so. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Johannes. That was an absolutely an amazing tour de force. Uh, please join me in, in, in thanking uh, Johannes um, and, and also for this uh, in, you know, very engaging discussion. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Brandon. All have a good day. Lovely. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Tschüss.